Yeah. All right, so I'm going to be talking about the radial and temporal evolution of stream interaction regions and curtain interaction regions. So to start off with um, talking about what these are, stream interaction regions form when you have high speed streams that overtake slow speed streams. And so typically when you have coronal holes on the sun, um, they will emit these higher speed streams. And as they come across the slow speed streams, you end up getting this density pile up um, and forming these regions. So as you see in the figure on the right, you have this region of high speed streams that kind of just compress um, on that boundary. So these can be characterized as an increase in flow speed, obviously, um, an increase in the temperature and entropy from the slow to fast wind, an increase in the density ahead of the interface where you're getting that kind of pile up of plasma, um, and an enhancement in the magnetic field and the pressure at the stream interface. Uh, so when we form these are SIRs or stream interaction regions, but if they persist long enough, so the coronal hole has rotated once around the solar circuit surface, then we call them co-rotating interaction regions since they've co-rotated. Um, and these structures are important because they're known to form shocks for the heliosphere and accelerate particles at these shocks and compression regions. And so uh, they are able to accelerate a lot of particles and the density pile up and pressure are also very geoeffective. And so um, they're really important uh, processes we have. Talking about the radial evolution, uh, a lot of this kind of goes back to some really early studies. So some of the early work kind of trying to model these uh, CIR regions as they propagate outwards were done by Hunhausen back in 1973. And what he had done is created this fluid model where he just took a slow moving fluid and shot a you know high speed fluid through it to see how it would evolve as it radially went outward away from the source. And so what they saw was that you know as you move further outward, you will slowly end up forming into one of these shocks. And so they estimated that you'd start forming these shocks at or beyond one AU. You'd also get these density pileups um, as you move further outward. And you'll notice that there's kind of this large scale trend that's more just you know, the one over R squared um, dependence we have in the solar wind, but you get these pileups that get more and more pronounced as you flow further away from the sun. And you also see that the temperature uh, increase at the, it becomes much more stark um, as you move further out. But um, from this, you know, this is a very early study, um, really kind of going into the early Helios era. And so, um, the next thing that needed to be done is test that in situ. So the Helios spacecraft were a pair of two spacecraft that went in really close to the sun into about 0.3 AU. And so the study by Richter and Luttrell was one of the first to really conduct the Suros epoch analysis of these events to really look at how do these structures evolve as they radially flow away from the sun. And so they took 16 well-defined SIRs between 0.3 and 0.4 AU, as well as 31 SIRs between 0.9 and 1 AU. And what they observed was something very similar to the fluid model where the density enhancement becomes more pronounced as you flow further outward. So on the left here is the 0.3 to 0.4 and the right is near one AU. And these are all normalized to their peak values. You see the velocity shear sh is, becomes steeper. Um, and so uh, you know, as you go further out, you're eventually gonna form that shock. You also see that the magnetic field enhancement becomes more pronounced as you flow further out, as well as the temperature and the pressure enhancement. And so these early observations were in good agreement with the, the fl fluid model. You should know that, um, as I said earlier, a lot of times you have these energetic particles associated with CIRs. And the main source for those is these shock processes that can happen um, at and beyond 1 AU, as well as compressed acceleration. So before you fully form the shock, you can get a really strong um, compression region that is able to accelerate particles as well. But even with these, we have a radial dependence because even though you are accelerating the particles further out in the heliosphere, they can then propagate back into the inner heliosphere along the field lines. And as they do that, we actually expect various processes to act on them. And so as they propagate inward, um, the low energy particle spectra is expected to steepen. And the reason for that is you get you know, scattering effects and uh, deceleration of the particles. And so, the early models kind of saying what you'd see here is that um, if you had these different traces, these are for different locations of a shock. And so if the shock is at 1 AU, where the observer is, you get this profile that's more just indicative of the shock acceleration. But as you move that shock further away from the observer, you see the low energy particles get inhibited to reaching the observer. And so you would get this bend where the lower energy particles not only steepen, but kind of drop out. And so with that, um, we have you know, also this radial dependence to the energetic particles. 
to make matters a little more complicated, we also have a lot of temporal evolution. And so um, what we mean by that is if you were to take one of these persisting CRR structures that is co-rotating around with the sun, and so it's kind of washing over your spacecraft, you know, rotation after rotation, what we need to keep in mind is, you know, not every observation of that structure is going to be identical. It's not some rigid structure that's fixed in time that's just passing you. And so if you were to take several observations of the same CIR, which is shown on the right, and put them on top of each other, you really see that not only do your plasma and fields observations vary between each observation, but you can get really large variations in energetic particle content, which is the bottom three. And so during the first observation of the CIR back when it's just an SIR, you really didn't see much energetic particles at all at stereo. Whereas in the second observation, we start seeing some, and in the third, there's a large enhancement of these particles. And so we're seeing that, you know, not only are there radial evolutions, but just, you know, every observation of the same structure can be a little bit different just from the structure evolving um, in time. Additionally, as the structure moves around, you think about, you know, you form the shock, well, it continues to propagate outward. And because of that, each successive observation, even if they're close in longitude, might end up seeing fairly different observations just because you're magnetically connected to the shock at different parts. And so there's been um, several studies looking at both data and modeling work um, that have really illustrated this, that if you were to take three observations that are not too separated in longitude, then if you were to think of this shock, shock structure propagating outward, each of these will actually connect to a different part of the shock, which is going to have you know, different obliqueness um, to it. And then that can lead to different observations at the spacecraft just because of how you're connected. To go even further, even just ignoring you know, variations within a single CIR, um, there's also solar cycle dependencies. And so there's been a series of observations um, over multiple solar cycles to show that the superthermal composition associated with these CIR structures also varies with solar cycle phase. And so with that, um, you're kind of just piling on all these different dynamics, which is why when you kind of take what at first glance would seem like a pretty simple phenomena of you've got this high speed stream overtaking slow speed stream and the source is co-rotating around. And so um, you kind of paint out this spiral. It ends up actually being a pretty complicated process to fully understand. And so that kind of brings us to where we were prior to um, having Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter. Um, and so to kind of some of we have is, you know, CRs uh, become more developed as they flow outwards. We've seen that with early Helios observations and modeling. We know that the particles become accelerated at compressions and shocks at higher heliospheric distances before propagating back along the magnetic field lines into the inner heliosphere. And that as these particles propagate backwards, their lower energy ions are scattered, mirrored, and adiabatically decelerated. Um, which will change the spectral slopes of these ions and the intensities. And so the lower um, intensity of supernova ions um, will be lower at the inner heliosphere, um, as well as you know, that, that spectral distribution um, will be modulated. We also know that the spectral intensity of the ions varies temporally. And so um, looking at TIR structure as we're seeing it over and over again, we expect to have differences just from temporal evolution of this large structure, as well as differences in where we're connected to along it. And the CIR superthermal ion abundances vary throughout the solar cycle. And so what that kind of gets us to is this um, kind of adage that I kind of stole from my news community of, you know, if you've studied one CIR, you, you've really just studied one CIR. And more specifically, if you've studied a CIR at one point in time and space, you've still just studied that one CIR at one point in space and time. Um, and so you, you really can't take these single observations, these structures and really rebuild everything um, with this structure, both spatial and temporally. So with that, um, I now wanna kind of launch into a lot of the, the new studies, um, which will be really the meat of this seminar. And so to start off with um, going chronologically, we have the launch of Parker Solar Probe. So it launched in 2018 on August 12th, and is now the closest spacecraft to the sun um, it's providing inner heliosphere in situ observations in the orbit of Mercury for the first time since the Helios era. And so we're kind of regaining that ability to do these large radial um, profiles. And so when we take Parker Solar Probe and combine it with observatories at 1AU, this really allows us to put this lever arm of having these simultaneous measurements of these structures at different locations and different points in time. 
to try to start detangling some of the spatial temporal evolutions of these structures. And so um, shown here just shows that the way the particle probe mission goes is that every several orbits we have a Venus flyby that allows us to kind of lower the perigee of the mission. So we're gradually getting closer and closer. Um, and so uh, that. So with that, what we started doing is going through and trying to catalog all of these CIR events with their corresponding observations um, at other spacecraft. And so already we've gone through the first five orbits of Parker Solar Probe and found um, SRCRs with these corresponding observations. And all of these are being compiled into a living catalog um, that are gonna be kept on the Science Gateway Parker Solar Probe. And this is just showing that um, as we go through these different orbits, um, so this is showing the first five, the vertical lines are showing where we have these nice CIR events that have these corresponding um, observations. So for the Parker Solar Probe observations, there's really two I wanna dive into. And I'm starting with the first one where um, the really neat thing is we had an event of the CIR, we have really nice observations at L1, Parker Solar Probe and Stereo A. And so I'm gonna play this movie in a second, but what I want you to look at is, so these are showing um, velocity uh, maps using WSA NLIL. And there's this high speed stream here um, that I want you to follow. And as I hit play, you'll be able to see where the different observatories go. So I wanna point out first, um, Parker Solar Probe is here. Um, Earth is around here. Um, and we'll see Stereo A come around a little bit. And so starting, you see that um, L1, so effectively Earth in this case, um, first encountered this high-speed stream um, here. So we go forward, you see that the stream persists. And so you see a CME go off, we're watching Parker Solar Probe. So it comes around and meets Parker Solar Probe and Parker Solar Probe is at 0.32 AU. And then if we continue going forward, we see that the CIR rotates around until it reaches stereo A. And so this is a situation where we have these three measurements at different points in time, different longitudes and different radial distances um, with Parker Solar Probe. And so um, with this, uh, we wanna start by saying, okay, well, you know, what, do we, what do we see in this event? So stepping through, this is starting with the um, L1 observations. So I have ACE and black and wind as red um, data points here. We see that we have what we very much expect for these CIRs. We have a velocity enhancement uh, going from the slow to fast solar wind. There's a corresponding density pileup um, upstream of the interface. We see the temperature and the entropy uh, both increase when going from the slow to fast solar wind. And we have this nice pressure enhancement at the interface along with magnetic field en enhancement. Additionally, um, looking down at the energetic particles, we see that there's not very much of an energetic particle response um, to the observations at L1. Um, there's this very slight enhancement here, uh, but it's unclear if that's related to the CIR at all or if it's related to the heliospheric current sheet crossing here. But um, either way, there's, there's not a large energetic particle response. Next, the structure hit Parker Solar Probe. And so with this, we see that again, we have this velocity enhancement. Um, there's a little bit of a density pile up um, upstream of the interface. Temperature and entropy do as we expect. So we have the pressure um, magnetic field enhancement. But look at the energetic particles in the bottom. Here we have a localized enhancement in um, the epilo part observed particles and then a broader enhancement about a day later. Um, I should say uh, in the video, we saw this uh, CME, so the black region that shot off. Um, this is the enhancement earlier on is related to that. So it's, that's not related to the CIR. But what's interesting is we, we have these kind of two peaks. Um, and so um, I'll talk more about that in a second. Going to the stereo A observations, we again see um, the CIR, we have a velocity enhancement and all the other indicative uh, traits of the CIR. We're going to the energetic particles, we see there's a very broad enhancement that starts at the CIR interface um, and then persists for several days afterwards. And so we see that comparing, you know, these three different observations of the structure, we get very different pictures from the energetic particles. Now, what's interesting is that uh, for Parker Solar Probe, we have these two enhancements, whereas later on when it's seen at stereo A, we have one. There's a lot of um, studies that have come out uh, with observations at 1AU that have suggested that uh, 
you have kind of this mix of two different sources um, of these energetic particles that one is more this compressive source that can happen closer to the sun. And the other one is the well-known shock accelerated particles that happen further out between you know, three to five AU where the shock forms. And a lot of studies have kind of indicated that there's a good possibility that what you're seeing is that um, when you look at the lower energy part of the distribution, um, those possibly are, are, they seem like they're more so related to this um, closer in acceleration. And so there's been studies by Rachel Fillett and um, Rob Ebert that have looked at comparing the composition of these particles, um, they really do seem more indicative of, of a closer in acceleration source. Whereas when you go to the higher energy particles, those are much more indicative of this, these shock accelerated particles. And what we see here is that um, epi low is the lower energy of the energetic particle instruments. We have these two peaks. If we were to look at epi high, we only see um, the enhancement that happens a day or so later. And so one interpretation of this is we might actually be seeing that at this interface where you have this, this strong compression region forming, you're actually getting local acceleration happening closer to the sun here, whereas these particles might be more so from your more remote um, acceleration at the shock that have streamed into the inner heliosphere. So a lot of the observations we had at 1U look more like we see in stereo A, where you have just this broader enhancement um, rather than two separate enhancements. Um, and a lot of these studies have kind of tried pulling out from that these different energy populations to show that you know there might be these two acceleration regions, but they kind of happen on top of each other. And so this could be a situation where we actually have managed to separate these populations. So from this study though, um, it's where we left this study, but this event um, has then spawned um, further work. And so Colin Joyce then went on to further look at the spectral slopes um, during this event at Parker Solar Probe. And what they found is if they broke up, so they're specifically looking at this broader enhancement that happened later on, but when they break up these intervals into subintervals, they see that the energy spectra of these populations definitely changes throughout the event. And so early on in the event, you have interval one, you see that the lower energy superthermal particles and the more energetic particles, while there is still a, a, you know, a, a spectral break in this distribution, your spectral slopes are actually much more similar to each other. Whereas as you go further into that enhancement, you see that um, there's a much more uh, stark difference between the lower and higher energy energetic particles. And so from this, what that seems indicative of is that again, you know, early in the event, you're probably getting shock acceleration or a crest of acceleration closer to the sun than having to go all the way out to where the shock is forming. But later in the event, um, these look much more like what we see at 1AU related to the shock acceleration um, happening further out in the heliosphere. Beyond that, what we also note is that um, when we look at these, if we go back to thinking about um, the Fisk and Lee model of, of as you propagate these particles further into the heliosphere, eventually you expect that rollover to happen for lower energy particles. But we don't, we don't observe that. So actually, um, if you see here, you know, we have these two power laws but the lower energy particles aren't rolling over and being inhibited um, of getting all the way in. And at this point, you know, we're at 0.3 AU, so we're pretty close to the sun. And so this tells us that the modulation of these particles as they're streaming towards the sun is far weaker um, than we had previously expected. That at this point, you know, we're not seeing that these lower energy particles are being blocked from reaching the inner heliosphere. And so to try to better explain why that might be, um, Nathan Schwedrin's been doing work looking at sub Parker spiral effects. And so if you think about the magnetic foot points moving closer to these coronal hole boundaries, so the coronal holes again are where you're getting these high speed streams falling out from the sun. Um, when you're near those boundaries in the, the fast and slow solar wind, um, you can end up stretching that field line um, and forming these sub Parker spirals. So there's these more radial magnetic field lines than you would have just from a simple Parker solution. And so um, this diagram here shows where the blue lines are showing if you were to solve the Parker spiral solution, um, what you'd get. But by having this, these kind of, um, this effect of, of this boundary effect where you make these field lines more radial, then you see that you actually can reach the shock regions much faster. And so if you were to have an observer here, following the sub Parker solution, it's much closer to the shock than if you were to have to follow one of these blue lines all the way over to where the shock is. And so what that allows you to do is drastically shorten the distance these particles are having to propagate in order to get to the inner heliosphere.
And so if you were to then think what effect that might have, well, for a lot of this modulation, it's a transport effect. And so if you're able to have much easier and faster access into the inner heliosphere um, and more direct access, then if you were to then model what you would expect that to do to our spectral distributions, you see that the Parker solution would see a much um, harder spectra for these low energy particles um, than the sub Parker spiral would. So you have much less modulation. Going on from that, uh, Nathan Schwedrin did this modeling work for the same event that we've been talking about. And in this, um, they, he figured that from the time that we passed that CIR interface uh, to where the observer is, you can calculate both the Parker spiral and sub-Parker spiral solution to find both you know, the distance out to the acceleration region, as well as what angle the magnetic field would have at that point. And also then you can calculate from all of this, what is the injection energy of the particle um, you would need. And um, to compare that with the data, he then computed what you would expect this distribution to look like for both these solutions, so both a Parker's file solution and a sub Parker's file solution, and overplotted with the, the blue data points here um, what uh, Parker solar probes saw. We see is for the higher energy particles, so the one to five MeV, we see that the sub Parker's file solution actually expects the peak and the, the flux to happen a few days after the interface crossing, which is what we observed by Parker solar probe. Whereas we go to these low energy particles, we see there's kind of this double bump in the observations um, that match very well the sub Parker spiral solution and match a little bit for the Parker spiral solution. And so already with these uh, early observations, this really is kind of pointing to needing to, to put a little more thought into what is the large scale structure of these CIRs and how are how is an observer actually magnetically connected to these acceleration regions since it really does seem from these that what you have is these more radial field lines in the high speed stream region that are allowing you to have a much more direct access to these acceleration regions, which explain why we don't have as much modulation in these particles. So um, kind of stepping through really quick, the lessons from this one event that we've had at Parker Solar Probe, as we saw the CIR was observed at Parker Solar Probe on November 15th, 2018. And this provided a lot of insight in CIR acceleration and transport. The CIR structure uh, was also observed by ACE um, and WEND as well as Stereo A. And the superthermal ions are seen to be temporally evolving throughout these um, observations. So as we go from um, L1 to Parker Solar Probe to Stereo A, there's definitely still some temporal evolution occurring from this structure. But we also see that uh, Parker Solar Probe, um, we kind of have these, these two peaks in superthermal ions. Um, and it seems like one of them might be more related to kind of a, a local or closer in acceleration whereas the other one is a more remote acceleration. And looking more at that more remote acceleration, we see that you know, the, the spectra are showing far weaker modulation than we would have expected, which really does indicate that we're probably having this sub Parker spiral um, magnetic topology that's allowing for much more direct access into the inner heliosphere um, than you'd have if you just had Parker spiral solution. But, um, from that, that's not you know the only really interesting event we've had. So the other way we can go with these observations is instead of focusing just on the Parker Solar Probe observations, is we can kind of bring in more of the Heliophysics System Observatory. And so we have one CIR event that um, stands out because Parker Solar Probe and Stereo A were nearly radially aligned. And so um, at this time when Parker Solar Probe observed a quartic interaction region. And so here we have the Parker Solar Probe observations in black and the Stereo A observations are in blue. Um, we've shifted the Stereo A observations backward in time by 1.77 days to line up these structures. And that really agrees with um, the structures having to radially flow between the different spacecraft. But um, what you'll notice is that uh, we've also scaled the Stereo A observations using these known radial scaling laws. And so um, the density we know falls off as one of our squared. And so using the, the difference in the locations of these two spacecraft, we adjusted the stereo A observations using these relations to what it would have been at Parker Solar Probe. And we see that the data lines up on, lie on each other really beautifully. And so this is a really nice example where there's clearly not very much of a temporal evolution between these, um, that we really are looking at something where any differences we're observing between these is, is more likely driven by the spatial difference of the radial evolution of this um, structure as it flows outward. And so what we see is that, um, as we expect looking at the density, there's a little bit more of a density pileup seen in Stereo A observations than the Parker observations. Um, unfortunately though, for this event, uh, 
periodically uh, Parker Solar Probe does uh, KA band telemetry downlinking. And when that happens because of the processor limitations on board the spacecraft, they have to pause data collection. And that's the reason why we have these blackouts in the data. Unfortunately, um, one of those happened to happen kind of at this interface. Um, so we can't look too much at differences between the two interface observations. But what we do notice when we look at the energetic particle observations is that both of them see energetic particles um, and that the Parker Solar Probe one, which is the second from bottom, uh, actually kind of lasts longer than what we see at Serial A, which is the bottom panel. And so um, with that, we wanted to go ahead and look more in depth at how these energetic particles are varying um, at these two different locations. And so what we did is we took a slice for um, this interval here um, where we have both epilow observations as well as observations from stereo A. And we took another slice at stereo A um, kind of right in the heart of the, where the interface likely is. And from that, we built up uh, these spectra. And so what we see is that the green um, spectra are from stereo A, the red spectra are from Parker Solar Probe um, protons, and the blue spectra is Parker Solar Probe helium-4. And what we see is that the triangle points up here, this is the observations from earlier in the CIR and when the, um, the enhancement was more intense, as we see that it is more intense. Looking a little bit later when we have observations at both spacecraft, we see that um, the stereo A observation is a little bit less intense and the spectral slope has uh, become slightly harder so, um, than it was earlier in the observation. Comparing that to what we have at Parker Solar Probe, we see that the Parker Solar Probe protons actually have virtually the same power law um, spectral slope as what was observed at stereo A. And so in this case, we were really seeing that there's kind of negligible modulation between these two observations, even though Parker Solar Probe's at 0.5 AU and zero A's at one AU. At Parker Solar Probe, looking more into the composition, um, we see that the helium-4 observations is much harder. So we have a uh, you know, shallower slope to those um, distributions, which has been seen before at one and, and beyond one using Ulysses. Um, and a lot of that is kind of pointed to the probability of this um, really preferred acceleration of pickup ions. And so if you have these uh, pickup ions going through some of these shock regions, you can actually have them be at a higher um, energy related to the injection energy and get more acceleration. And so with that, um, this is something we we're gonna look at more going forward is, you know, if we, we already expect this further out in the heliosphere related to the acceleration, but we also know that protons and helium ions have different rigidities. And so as they transport into the inner heliosphere, you'd actually expect them to transport differently and so with this, we're starting to able to kind of pull out these compositional differences. In this case, though, it's still showing a very similar picture to we had at 1AU, um, similar to the previous event. But going further um, for this event, we, we did have the case where the Parker Solar Probe observation saw this superthermal ion enhancement for a longer period of time than was observed at Stereo A. And so we wanted to get a better handle on, on what that might mean from a, a large scale structure uh, topology sense. And so what we did is we took all of our observations, took the start and stop time of these enhancements at both Stereo A and Parker Solar Probe and co-rotated them backwards in time to a reference point. And so in this case, we picked um, when Parker Solar Probe started seeing energetic ions, that was our start time as our reference point. And we then computed uh, Parker spirals for um, based on the velocities observed at Parker Solar Probe at both that start and stop time. And so that gives us this kind of compression field line, which is the solid line, and the rarefacted field line, the high-speed stream, which is the dotted line. And from this, what we see is that when we do that, um, not only does it agree very well with our start and stop time, so it seems to be painting kind of a consistent picture. This is likely the, you know, approximately the topology we have for this event. But we also see that one of the interesting results of this is since your velocity is so much higher in the rarefaction region, it gives you a different curvature to the Parker spiral field line. And what that gives you then is you have this radial dependence to the longitudinal width of this flux tube. And so out at uh, stereo A, we see that this spans for about 18.8 .8 degrees in longitude, whereas closer in where Parker solar probe was, we see it's actually about 31.8 degrees. And so um, you can really nicely explain kind of the reason why you have a longer 
um, observation at Parker Solar Probe um, just by pointing, you know, doing this, this simple um, Parker spiral solution here. So with this, so we also see that where these would come together, which is likely where you're going to have your acceleration, this is happening about 1.5 AU, which is pretty close in for CIRs. Usually we talk about, you know, the shocks forming out at three to five AU. But this also does a, a, a nice job of kind of explaining why in this event, unlike the previous event, um, the Parker spiral seems to be doing a pretty good job. Because if you think about these sub Parker spiral field lines, really we're going to get most of the deviation in these solutions is when your acceleration region is further away. And so when your acceleration region is so close to 1AU, um, then these, these solutions kind of converge. And so going back to um, Nathan Schwedron's plots, if you look at um, his plots for when you have these uh, close together in the in your heliosphere before you really allowed them to go further out into the heliosphere, they do agree pretty well. And so this is an event where because acceleration is so close, we can just use Parker's file field lines to get this effect. But you would think that if you were to have a further out um, acceleration region, then the sub Parker's file field line, if anything, would just lead to this rarefactive field line being even more radial. And so that would even more exasperate this radial effect of how longitudinally wide the observations would be. And so um, again, this is kind of allowing us to, to start probing more at this actual large scale structure of these events. So with that, um, I want to go into um, Solar Orbiter a little bit and talk about uh, one of the first light papers that we're actually going to be submitting on Friday. Um, and so this is like hot off the press uh, results that I'm very excited to be sharing. Um, so a brief introduction for Solar Orbiter. Uh, Solar Orbiter launched earlier this year in February um, and actually got to go to the launch before everything locked down. And it was, it was a really, really nice launch. Um, it's heavily outfitted both with remote sensing and in situ observations. Um, and so uh, Parker Solar Probe is, is much more of a, you know, slimmed down mission to get as close as we can to the sun and get these really valuable measurements. So Orbiter is going to be a little bit further out, um, but is a bit more of a Christmas tree. And so we have a whole lot of remote sensing, um, so it's a little bit further out that we can actually look down on the so solar surface on, in the corona, um, which is fantastic. Uh, it also expands to the observatory um, in the near heliosphere, but providing another point um, of observations. And as the mission goes forward, it's using gravity assist to actually crank itself out of the ecliptic plane. And so um, as we go forward in time, this will allow us to really look at latitudinal variations of these structures as well. And so again, we're kind of building up this constellation of observatories that really is letting us dive into some of these large structures. So with that, um, I'm associated with the CIS instrument. And so this is mainly focusing on that one instrument. But during the first five uh, months of operation, we've already observed six CIRs. And so um, those are these regions that have painted out in orange here. Um, for those interested in SCP events, uh, we've also observed a number of SCP events, including helium-3 event rich events. Um, and those are covered by uh, Glenn Mason's paper that will be coming out as well. Um, so I encourage you all to look forward to that special issue that will be coming out in ANA. But um, for these, we wanted to really kind of, again, look at how these structures vary um, spatial temporally. And so we took the SIS instrument and wanted to compare it with the ULICE instrument on ACE. And the reason we wanted to do that is that uh, SIS is essentially the same design as ULICE. It's an updated design. Um, it's a little bit more sophisticated, much more sensitive. And we have two telescopes. But um, it's kind of the daughter instrument of ULICE. And so we can do really honest comparisons by comparing these two instruments. And so what we did is we time shifted all of the ULIS observations um, by calculating a, a foot point uh, longitude and then finding how much co-rotation time would be required to line up these CIR structures. And what we see is that for five of these events, we definitely have a nice response in both uh, CIS and ULIS. And so we really can dive into comparing um, how these structures evolve between the two. For the sixth event, um, you could maybe argue that this one point might be a response in ULICE, but it's a very weak response. Um, it's unclear how much of this is due to this being the, the weakest of the CIRs seen at Solar Orbiter um, versus this is also when the spacecraft were further away. Um, so earlier on, um, we were pretty much lined up. And so we gradually got further and further away, which, which also might explain this. So taking these observations, we can then dive into looking at the power law spectra again for these. And so um, we have here is uh, the cis uh, protons are in purple, cis helium-4 is in blue, and the cis carbon and oxygen are in orange and red. 
whereas the uh, ACE Ulyse uh, helium-4 is the green traced here. And from looking at these events, we see that um, the spectra are very similar between all of these events. Um, and actually looking at the, the spectral slopes, we do a parallel fit to these. Um, they're very similar for all of these events. Going beyond that, we see that comparing the ACE observations with the CIS observations, again, you're not really seeing a lot of variation between these observations. It seems like there's not much modulation between the two. Um, and so this, this is, again, kind of confirming what we've been seeing with Parker Solar Probe. But we also noticed that, you know, as we would expect, the intensities are lower at CIS. And so um, for this, we really wanted to do then is say, okay, well, we have these observations. Let's kind of put these in more of a context of what we've seen before. So to do that, um, the first thing I want to note is that these CIR events we're seeing um, in the solar orbiter era so far have been really weak. And so if we were to compare um, in this top panel, um, this is for the CR event two, we have a case where the ACE observations and the solar orbiter observations are, are both rather weak. So we take a, a representative um, CIR from previous observations, such as this one from 2000, which was a more solar active period, but we see we have orders of magnitude less um, intense um, superthermal ions. We also notice, though, is that the spectral slope is different. And so if we look at the spectral slope of the kind of solar orbiter era CIR events, it's actually much more similar to the more energetic ions from these solar active periods. And so not only are we, we less intense, but it, it seems like we're more agreeing with these more energetic particles as far as our slope than we are the same energy range that we're looking at for these events. And so um, what's really not clear at this point then is you know, what, what might be causing that. So one, one potential um, explanation would be that you know, these events are happening with really slow solar wind. And so um, the nominal solar wind we're seeing during these events is only around 300 kilometers per second um, rather than you know, 400 that we're used to. And even the high-speed streams of these have been pretty slow. And so you know, our, our peak high-speed streams are more like 500 kilometers per second rather than going up to like six or 700 kilometers per second. And so what's not clear is if this might be affecting um, these acceleration regions that, you know, is this leading to a, a weaker compression um, or is this affecting, you know, how strong shocks are and where they're forming, if they're forming further out or not. Um, and so these are a lot of things that we want to dig in further. Um, but we definitely, from this comparison, are seeing that something, something's going on here um, that, that merits further study. We also then see is if we want to compare how much the flux of these particles is decreasing as function of real distance. And so as we you know, go closer to the sun, um, we do expect to have you know, scattering processes and deceleration and different things like that lead to us having less particles. Well, if we compare um, what we're seeing between cis and ULI, so just taking the, the you know, picking a, a certain energy channel and dividing the cis in, uh, flux from the ULI's flux, we see that, um, it agrees really well with some more historical observations from Van Hollenbeck, where they compared Helios to M7 um, observations. The interesting thing with how well these agree, though, is that we wouldn't necessarily think they should agree. So for the Van Hollenbeck uh, observations, not only are they much more energetic, they're looking at 1.58 MeV um, particles, they're also looking at protons. Whereas for us, we're looking at a lower energy helium ion. And Again, you know, the, the protons and helium have different rigidities. And so it's, it's really interesting if, if this does end up holding as we get more events, because um, ad admittedly, we only had four good cis utilized comparisons here for this. But if this does end up holding and these are falling off at very similar rates, um, then again, that kind of points to, you know, these transport effects are, are, are not behaving the way we would have, have thought. You know, we would have, have thought that the, you know, the protons and helium would have had a different slope. And so um, definitely there's a lot more work that needs to be done here, uh, but we're already getting some really interesting comparisons um, with Solar Orbiter. And so um, with that, I wanted to briefly talk about, uh, kind of sum up things, talk about what we're, we're planning on doing going forward. So observations from Parker Solar Probe, Solar Orbiter and missions at 1AU are providing new insights into energetic particle acceleration and transport associated with the CIRs. 
and are enabling these new multi-point studies to understand the large scale topology, radial variation and evolution of these structures. So really for the first time we're able to kind of, well not first time, but we're able to really do these more expanded studies with these multi-point observations that you, you really can't tease out all of the science from just a single observation. So looking ahead with both Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter, um, what we're really starting to unlock is studies looking at the compositional dependence of transport and acceleration mechanisms. And so various acceleration mechanisms, you expect different mass or mass per charge um, dependencies. And so with um, the new you know, instruments we have on these missions, we're able to really start probing not only the acceleration mechanisms um, of these structures um, and other structures, as well as you know, the, if, if there are these compositional dependencies to the, the transport. You can also do in-depth studies of particle anisotropies um, at SARCAR. So there's been some early um, studies hinting that there might actually be some slight anisotropy. And with CIS, uh, we have really nice observations where we have telescopes pointed both along the Parker style towards the sun as well as away from the sun. And since it's this you know, same instrument design, we're able to start going through and really trying to tease out these very small few percent um, anisotropy differences in these events. Um, we're also going to extend these investigations um, to look at these radial dependencies. And so, um, as we already saw with the previous ones, we're agreeing pretty well with the Van Hollenbeck studies so far, but that's only using five months of data. And so, um, what we're really hoping is to not only populate that, but populate it for different ion species um, and really look at um, these radial dependencies. You can also start looking at latitudinal structuring. And so, as uh, Solar Orbiter cranks out of the ecliptic, we can do multi point observations comparing um, it with. Parker Solar Probe or observations at 1AU to really look at um, how much these structures really do depend on latitudinal variations. Um, and uh, one of the really great things we have with Solar Orbiter is we can also really dive into helium three rich SCP events, which I did not talk about at all in this talk. Um, but um, this is really gonna start unlocking, especially with the remote sensing we have on Solar Orbiter, a lot of information into um, kind of the, the particles you get out of flare events. It also let us uh, probe acceleration at CMEs close to the sun. So there's a lot of science that we have to do. Um, and so I wanted to end my talk with an advertisement. Um, so we're now seeking applications for a postdoctoral researcher um, for our group. Um, and this would be to work both with Parker Solar Probe observations as well as Solar Orbiter. Um, and so if anyone is happening to be looking for a postdoc position, um, please reach out to me for more information. I'd be more than happy to uh, share that with you. Um, but with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time and um, open it up for questions. Thanks, Trevor. Really interesting stuff. Um, and uh, uh, it seems like you have a full plate here for the future. Um, it's a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so are there any questions for Robert? I guess while people are coming off mute, um, Robert, I had one question. Um, uh, so I thought the, uh, it, it was really interesting. You were showing um, um, some uh, data from the conjunction of um, uh, Parker Solar Probe and Stereo A and B. Um, uh, how often do those types of conjunctions occur? Do you expect many more events like that or? Right, so that's, a, that's an interesting question. So we, we get conjunctions fairly often as far as just being in the right place. Uh, the problem is having the sun cooperate and give you an event. And so, you know, we've had many of instances where, you know, I mean, for a lot of the energetic particle work, we'd like even more than a, a radial conjunction would be to be along the Parker spiral. And so if, if we could actually have this setup um, where instead of having to co-rotate co things back in time, if we actually had Parker and Serio A along a magnetic field line. That's ideal. We've had multiple of those, um, but during those, we've just not had these interject particle events to really look at. And so um, really we, we get conjunctions every few months with Parker Solar Probe. Um, I know we've, we have a, a list internally that we have um, of kind of all of these really fun, both radial and Parker aligned conjunctions, as well as, you know, I think there's a few events where we have um, situations where we're both radially aligned with one observatory and Parker aligned with another one at the same moment. Um, it's just, you know, finding the, the magic words to utter to have the sun give you something then is kind of the, the trick. Thanks. Any other questions? <laughs> 
Um, it's not a question, but just a comment or um, just a sharing my disappointment. Not with the talk, definitely. <laughs> it was a great talk. Uh, my concern is that uh, the Parker Solar Probe solar wind data is very, very sparse. So, so one of the- You are missing yes. a lot of- Right, yeah, so I can ahead. talk a little bit about that. Um, so throughout here, this, this event is pretty sparse, um, but part of that depends on where we are in our orbit. So especially when we are near perihelion, we have much more continuous data. During this event, I should also say a lot of the gap before the event is um, SBC, was temporarily off um, for various reasons and happened to come on right before this event happened. So we were very fortunate to have the instrument turned back on to capture this event. But um, there are other intervals where we have much more continuous observations. Um, if I go back to kind of by sort of an overview plot, um, you really see though that a lot of our observations are gonna be tied closer to the perihelia. And so, um, yeah, unfortunately, as we get further, when, when Parker Solar Probe is further away from the sun, we, it's less observation. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, well, I'm glad to hear that. I might have to double check if I was, um, if I had found um, data, more data closer to Brahelian. Uh, but when I looked at the um, PSB merged data at the SPDF, and I, um, I think I collected data right from the same beginning to till October of this year, and most of the days I had um, uh, data gaps. That uh, intermittently, whenever there was data that might be close to Brazilian, but I think that's the time when they downlink the data, and which the during which time the uh, instrument is, you know, still turned off. So they're going to do the downlinking further away from perihelia. Um, I know that so during the third orbit here, um, this big gap is because the SBC, so the, the Faraday cup, um, had a current limit reached, and so it turned off briefly. Um, the other ones, it, it depends what you're doing. One, if you're if you're really focusing near perihelia anyway, especially for the more recent orbits. Um, one thing to also look for is looking at the span observations. So the sweep instrument is the, the one that gets the thermal plasma and has both a Faraday cup and a ESA time of flight. And so the, actually, I think I have a picture. So um, the span instrument is kind of on this side. So it's on the ram facing side. And so, yeah, here, it's so the ram facing side. And so when you're near perihelia, you're actually moving so fast tangentially around the sun that the solar wind uh, core actually gets swept up on the ram side of the spacecraft rather than um, you know, from the Faraday cup, which faces the sun. So close uh -huh. to perihelia, um, it's always good to actually look at what the span sensor has. Um, Cause that actually might have a capture more of the distribution and be a more accurate solar wind measurement. Mm, okay, okay, that's a good uh, point. I also have a question related to that uh, mapping you did, the spiral, Parker spiral. Mm -hmm. how, uh, how did you do that? Did, was it a ballistic uh, inverse mapping or? So, yeah, so I can talk more about that. So what I did for this is, is it's actually quite simple. So um, I took, here. So I took the start time of the enhancement and the stop time of the enhancement of Parker Solar Probe and lined up what the radial velocity would be at that time. And so then right. all I did to draw this out is I took the, um, just the Parker's file equation um, using a fixed rotation um, of 14.7 degrees per day. And um, you can then solve for what the Parker's file would be given that velocity. And where I okay. placed these lines is based on kind of that time lag. So the time from the start time of the enhancement to the stop time, I then use that fixed rotation to co-rotate backwards. Um, and so that's how I did this mapping. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I just brought it up because I, I'm doing an actual uh, inverse mapping of all the PSP, oh, cool. uh, solar, uh, PSP locations using 
the, the so-called ballistic mapping, and then using a coronal model, so you get the photospheric footprint of those locations. So if right, you're yeah. doing um, that, um, uh, you know, just, I'm writing a paper on that right now, uh, close to finishing. So uh, I'm interested in this mapping. Uh, yeah, I think we, what you're doing is is going to be far more accurate and is, is much more important if you're trying to look at, you know, where on the corona would a foot point mm -hmm. have, have been. Right. Um, mm -hmm. For this, we, we were less concerned about accurately finding out where on the corona we were and more just kind of painting out this this large structure, you know, further from the sun. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I would be interested in, you know, so what are you what are you planning on doing with with your modeling? Are you trying to, to find, you know, like solar wind sources? Yeah, uh, I mean, this is just a tool I d developed, um, uh, Nathan Schwartz. I work with Nathan Schwartz and, and he asked me to do this. So we, I developed this tool based on a coral model so we could do the accurate uh, mapping. I mean, I wouldn't say accurate, but accurate, as accurate yeah. as possible. Right. <laughs> a model can give you. So um, yeah, so that tool is almost ready and we can do any time for any um, any spacecraft in general, but right now it's um, ready for PSB. You know, if you replace the PSB um, ephemeris with any other spacecraft ephem ephemeris, then you'll get the corresponding um, locations for that spacecraft. Nice. So yeah, this can like be used really for anything. Tool. Yeah. I might yeah. reach out to you um, and ask you about that. I'll be happy to. Uh, yeah, I, I'm interested in CIRs and I was looking at the uh, solar wind data. I was uh, pretty disappointed, but when I saw your uh, presentation, I was very much impressed. I'm also, I think, uh, uh, uh -huh, go ahead. Sorry, I, I just wanted to say um, we should uh, perhaps give um, someone else a chance if there are any more questions for Robert. Um, we're running uh, dangerously Absolutely. low on time. <laughs> Absolutely, that's fine. But thank you so much, Alan, for the- Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll send you an email and we can talk more. Yeah, certainly. Any other questions? Well, we're just a bit past the hour now. Um, so let's thank our speaker one more time. Um, Robert, excellent talk. Um, applause, applause, applause. <laughs> um, the emoji applause just isn't as, isn't the same as their, uh, yeah. Anyways, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you again. And um, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Robert and Sarah, do you have a minute to um, hang on the line? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, do you want to stop recording or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to stop yeah. recording. <laughs>